Well, it is wonderful to be here. It, uh, to let you know who I am and why I'm here, uh, about a year ago, um, we thought we should get the pastors together of the Pentecostal churches in Halifax and uh, get to know each other. Thought that might be a good idea. Um, so we started having breakfast at uh, Mosaic over in Fairview. And uh, then we got this smart idea. We said, well, why don't we all exchange pulpits and try to find a... <laughs> what? <laughs> and um, we said, well, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, so that's why this is happening. And I think it's long overdue. It would, I just thought, we're Pentecostal churches. We should at least know each other. We should at least, you know, like, I, I, what's going on with you and how you feeling and what's swinging with you. And so um, it's been really good. The first few breakfasts were a little bit, a little bit tense. <laughs> um, no one knew what to say, but uh, I always end up saying the wrong thing, which makes everyone say the right thing. So it, it works out okay, you know. But uh, who am I? Uh, I uh, was born in Halifax and uh, came to my faith in 1980, uh, 79 actually, at Billy Graham. I'm a statistic, only 3% of the people who come forward at Billy Graham actually continue in that decision. Uh, so I'm a little bit of a statistic. And uh, the next year I was taken to this church called New Life Christian Center in the north end of Halifax. Um, and it is the only church I've ever gone to. Uh, it was uh, referred to me as a funky little black church. <laughs> and, uh, and that's what it was. And um, I was there right, well, we sold the building four years ago. Uh, yeah, roughly about four years ago. But over that period of time from 1980 until, until that period, um, I uh, started in radio, worked at a radio station some of you might know here, CFDR. Um, with Jerry, Lauren, or Jerry Parsons and a whole bunch of people and on air there for about nine years and then started working with Q104. Um, and there's not very many people who go from Q104 into the ministry. Um, <laughs> that doesn't happen very often. But uh, was with that organization for 29 years, uh, worked in the marketing and uh, promotions department of Q104. At one point we were C100 and CFDR and Cool. We were a whole, all together and then they separated us. But nonetheless, four years ago, I woke up on a Friday and God said to me, he said, uh, it's time. I looked at the ceiling and as soon as I woke up, he said, it's time. And I said, okay. It wasn't quite that easy as Roseanne, who is here, she's one of the leaders at Mosaic, um, knew because she was one of the people who got the phone call <laughs> when I said, uh, God's telling me to leave my job, and uh, single income, uh, two kids, a house, a mortgage, the whole thing, and I said, okay, so I went in on Monday, and I quit, and I was gone in two weeks, um, and that was the end of that, but it, uh, it was a wonderful 29 years, and in that period, I lay pastored at New Life Christian Center from 1994 onward, and we had the wonderful privilege of working with every kind of marginalized individual you could imagine in the north end of Halifax, from drug abuse to pedophiles to abused people to whatever it was, and uh, we're feeding 300 people a month and doing a coffee house every Thursday night where schizophrenics would come in and, and absolutely amaze you with their spiritual clarity and understanding if you gave them the chance to just speak. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. We decided to move for a number of reasons. So I said, uh, we decided to merge with a live Christian church in Fairview. And uh, that's where we've been ever since. We changed the name to Mosaic. And it was so funny because it was a, uh, a rather poor inner city black church coming together with Bill's church, which was definitely white. And... Uh, uh, and not so poor. Um, so it was an interesting coming together. And I, it's funny because I prayed for two things. I said, Father, I said, when you grow this church, I said, I don't want it to come from other churches in Halifax. Enough of that, thank you very much. And the rest, I said, and I want a black church. <laughs> so um, 
because that's all I've known. And I say, you scratch me, you scratch me hard, you're going to find a black man, which makes every black person run for their life. But uh, it's the truth. And so what's happened in the last six, six months, four months, Roseanne, um, we've had a huge increase of people from the Congo right off the plane, refugees, Nova Scotia is opening its arms to the Congo now. And uh, we've had uh, a slew of people. We are packed out. The building's not that big. Some of you know the building. It holds 100 people. Um, and we are packed. And it's mostly with people from the Congo. And what a revelation that is. They, uh, Adalbert said to me, he, I said, um, so we're going to have to go to another service, Adalbert. What should we do? And he said, well, go to a, a second service. I said, when should we do it? He's from the Congo. And uh, I said, later or earlier? He said, oh, no, earlier. And I said, why? He said, well, most people in the Congo go to church around 6 in the morning anyway. He said, because that's how early you have to go to get a good seat. I said, well, we don't quite have that problem <laughs> here, as, as you can see. And it's the same as at, at most churches. But uh, as the Congolese come in, they're teaching us. And I hope we are going to, uh, just through osmosis, that we will start getting what it is they have. They have a tremendous honor for God. They have a tremendous honor for the position of a pastor, which is really like it's taking us all by surprise. And they're teach they speak to you with, with a deference and with a respect that you really kind of, you feel almost odd about. But it is really the respect for Christ and the office and all that kind of stuff. So no need for pride because it just puts a greater responsibility on you to meet their expectation, actually. So, it's a wonderful thing. Um, I think that about answers it. Wife, two kids, live in Sambro, the most beautiful place in Nova Scotia. It's so beautiful there. And, um, you know, life is good. Life is really good. And I want to talk to you today about... John, <laughs> Jonathan, Pete, you on that? <laughs> there you go. Uh, about Jonathan, and uh, not about his necktie, even though I, you, I mean, that's commendable, buddy, that you tied that yourself. That's a pretty commendable thing. Most of them are just, you click them on and away you go. But we're starting at 1 Samuel 13, verse 4. Jonathan is, it just so excites me. It's always excited me, the story of Jonathan. And, um, and also, just to let you know, at the end of the service, I want to pray for people uh, today. Um, I was at Faith Tabernacle a couple of months ago, and uh, we started praying at around quarter to 12, and we ended at around quarter to 2. Um, because God speaks prophetically. And if you need a word from the Lord... Uh, we'll be doing that after the service, and we will leave the microphone on so that, and the way I do it is that if I'm going to prophesy over people, I want you to hear it, so that if I'm saying something crazy, something hokey, I want you to come up and, uh, and let me know that, and, uh, and if I'm saying something that is actually from God, then, and you'll know it, and everyone will be encouraged, so I, I leave the microphone on. But anyway, 1 Samuel 13, verse 4, Jonathan, we pick it up where all Israel heard the news that Saul had destroyed the Philistine garrison at Geba, and that the Philistines now hated the Israelites more than ever. So the entire Israelite army was summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. The Philistines mustered a mighty army of 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and as many warriors as the grains of sand on the seashore. They camped at Michmash, east of beth -Avon. The men of Israel saw what a tight spot they were in, and because they were hard-pressed by the enemy, they tried to hide in caves, thickets, rocks, holes, and cisterns. Some of them crossed the Jordan River and escaped into the land of Gad and Gilead. So this left Saul and Jonathan with only about 600 men. Not a great army, but it left them with about 600 men. Then we pick it up, uh, verse, or chapter 13, verse 19. There were no blacksmiths in the land of Israel in those days. The Philistines wouldn't allow them for fear they would make swords and spears for the Hebrews. 
So whenever the Israelites needed to sharpen their plowshares, picks, axes, or sickles, they had to take them to a Philistine blacksmith. And then in verse 22 it says, So on the day of the battle, none of the people of Israel had a sword or spear except for Saul and Jonathan. So Israel was in a desperate situation. It really was. Its warriors were running scared. They had no weapons against the largest Philistine army recorded in scripture. And they only had weapons of wood and stone, slings, clubs, and some knives. That's all they had. And sometimes churches in today's world, we can see ourselves this way. The Israelites were running into caves, and sometimes we as Christians are running into our churches to hide. Christians are becoming fearful to witness or to hold a godly opinion. And I'll say this about that, is that yes, we are living in a godless age. When was the world not godless? And if the gospel was able to thrive in the time of Paul's ministry in the Roman Empire, which was far more godless than anything we're living right now, let me tell you. Um, if the gospel was able to proliferate in that environment, it can proliferate today. We don't need to listen to the propaganda that's coming to us from the news media and from all of the cultural influences that come at us every day to tell us to back off and to shut up. Now, the difference is that we have done a horrible job as the church community, especially in the West. Unfortunately, we live next to this monster called the United States of America, which has the loudest evangelical charismatic mouthpiece in the world. And unfortunately, a lot of what's coming out of it is doing us a lot of harm on the ground in trying to preach the gospel and the love of Christ. So we do have most of the damage being done, we are doing ourselves. But it doesn't mean that we have to step back and that we have to run into our church and hide and go into a siege mentality that says, we, are, we just got to survive this, we just got to survive this, someday we're going to go to glory, we just got to survive this. That is not the way we should be. And Jonathan is going to show us that that is not the way we have to be. So, we're going to see what Jonathan does with this supposed weakness, and it is the same weakness that we may think we are in today as a church community in the world. 1 Samuel 14. One day, Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come on, let's go over to where the Philistines have their outpost. But Jonathan did not tell his father what he was doing, and that's a whole other sermon right there. Verse 6 says, let's go across to the outpost of those pagan, uncircumcised fellows, Jonathan said to his armor bearer, perhaps, key word, perhaps the Lord will help us, for nothing can hinder the Lord. He can win a battle whether he has many warriors or only a few. And this is where it gets inspirational for you and I. Jonathan said, perhaps. What is so significant about this whole story for me is that Jonathan did not have a word from the Lord. He didn't have a prophet telling him to go. He didn't have an angel descending and telling him to go. He didn't have anyone encouraging him on. He just said, perhaps God might do something. All that he had was faith and trust. Faith and trust in what? who God was, and who he was in God. This is so crucial. This is so crucial. God put this story of Jonathan in the Bible not to tease us. It's not there to tease us. It's not there to, to say, gee, I wish that would happen today, even though that's what we say. And, it, and to look back and to long at something that was back then but will never be today. That is not why God left that in the book. That's not why it's there. When you think of Gideon and the battle that Gideon had against the Midianites with 300 men, and I love this, that part of Gideon where Gideon gives them the opportunity, says, if you're scared, go home. And 22,000 people leave. Like, at least they're honest. At least they're honest about it. Which tells you something else. We think of these great warriors in 
the Old Testament and these soldiers going out and fighting, they were scared to death. They were scared to death. And maybe we're scared too of what's, what we have to face in a culture and in a time where the gospel message, as it has been portrayed, is not being accepted by our culture. I really, to go back to that point, I really do not believe that what we've portrayed is always really reflective of Christ and really reflective of the love of God. We are not the moral police of the world. We are not here to judge the behaviors of humanity. We are here to love humanity. That is it. That is the only reason we are here. Now, we are told to judge each other. And if we did more of that, maybe things might be a little bit better. Maybe there might be some fear of the Lord in our assemblies. Maybe there might be some righteousness. Maybe our children wouldn't be running off looking like the world around them. Not that, and, and, and trust me, I, like I'm okay with that. Like it doesn't mean we have to I all have long dresses and wear certain things and hair up. I'm not saying that. But boy, oh boy, if we would judge ourselves more completely within the church with proper motives and intentions, my heavens, the power of God would fall in churches. It would fall in churches. There are so many things not being said because somebody doesn't want to hurt somebody's feelings. But yet we'll go out and we see such propaganda going out from the church and judging the world and pointing fingers at the world and saying this is wrong and that is wrong and this is... And it's just ruining it on the ground for people who really want to just show the love of Christ. Which is, I believe, all God is calling us to do. So you had Gideon way back there with all those people running away from him. So why, so why did God put Gideon in the Bible so that maybe 117 years later, a young man named Jonathan would remember that God can save regardless of resources, human or otherwise. He knew the story of Gideon. And maybe that was going through what in Jonathan's mind. And what should be going through our mind when we find ourselves in a situation like we have in the world today? Jonathan. Gideon, all these stories, they're there not to tease us, not to say that uh, that was back then and not now. No, it's God's way of saying that's back then and it's able to happen today. It's got to happen today. It's got to. Or why else are we here? What are we here for? If we're here to just come and come to a Sunday service, go to a few fellowship things with food and stuff, and I know we all do it, but if that's why we're here, that is pathetic. That is pathetic for what the incredible thing that God intended the church to be. The force and the, the powerful converting force that the church was supposed to be in the world today. But it's a siege mentality that will run to a group instead of to society. That will choose to stay inside instead of going outside. And then what we'll try to do is try to take what we do in church outside. It doesn't work that way. People go out and they have, I get off on it, but people go out and have worship services in public. The world doesn't understand that. We do. Makes us feel religious and spiritual, but the world doesn't understand it. But anyway, there's a way to do it, and that's not what I'm here to talk about. But... Regardless of resources, human or otherwise, Jonathan was made aware that great things can happen in times of weakness. Today, 3,000 years later, here we find ourselves, and uh, you've got dwindling attendance in church because they're running away. They're running away. Dwindling resources? So what is our attitude going to be? It really is a choice we have to make. It's like... I mean, we can keep on going and doing what we're doing. We can keep on just going to church on Sunday. And I'm like, hey, I'm up here. I see people. I see them falling to sleep on Sunday morning. I see the, the people doing this on Sunday morning. I see it. Nobody else sees it. And each week I'll say, well, only four this week. No, only two this week. You kind of, kind of judge the whole service by how many people are doing that nod, right? And... I said, God, there's got to be more to it than this. There's, I, I, I mean, you didn't have Jesus die on the cross, go through what he went through, 
have these tremendous people of faith die the deaths they died so we can sit in church and nod off. My God. Right? There's got to be more that you have been intended for. And unfortunately, the only one who can make that decision is you and I. God's up there saying yea and amen to all the promises that are in Christ Jesus. He's saying, yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you, baby. I am with you. You just do it. I'm with you. But what happens? We just don't. You know, um, last year, there is a thing that gets together every year. It's called the Prayer Summit. And you were at it, Jonathan, weren't you? Down at Peggy's Cove? It, all the... The pastors, well, I say all the pastors, there's about 50 people. It's open to the pastors and leaders of the city get together, and we've been doing it for about five years, and we just sit for two days, and we kind of just feel and listen and, you know, try what's God saying? What's God saying? And last year, um, we were there, and uh, uh, this gentleman was uh, emceeing it or facilitating it, facilitating it, John Rodham. And uh, John comes up to me and he says, as John Ken, how many know John Rodham? Does anyone know John Rodham? He's a funny guy. And he goes, Keith, uh, I believe the Lord has something to say through you. And I said, well, I hope the Lord tells me about it. And I'm sitting there, there are all these pastors from the city, right? And you want to stand up with your face hanging out. Do you hope you have something? Um, and uh, sure enough, you know, God started to percolate something. And... To, the day ended with this sentiment. I had everybody stand, and I said, everyone take their hand, each other's hand, and I said, move the chairs. I said, stand in the line, and I said, take one step forward. And, I, and they all did it. I said, this is a kind of ceremonial uh, display of what God is saying to the church in Halifax. Just do anything. One step forward. Just take one step forward. If you want to start a youth group, if you want to start a Bible study, if you want to do an outreach down to Spring Garden Road, if you want to do an outreach down to, the, if you want to connect with a long lost person who you know is falling away from the faith and you wanted to, whatever it is, do it. Just do it. And it was such a very real sense prophetically in that meeting. And we all felt it by the end of the day. That God is saying, I am with the church of Halifax. I am with you. It is a time of favor. It is a, it is a season of favor right now. And I don't know how all that works. I don't know how that favor sometimes there, sometimes it's, sometimes God moves, sometimes he doesn't. I don't know how it all happens. But what I can tell you is now it's on Halifax Dartmouth. It is on our city. If we want to just take that one step forward. And that's what Jonathan was going to do. Having prayer meetings and Bible studies are great, but sometimes that's an excuse not to do anything. It's an excuse not to do anything. Not that I will ever say anything against Bible studies or prayer meetings, because we need more of that, heaven knows, in the proper context and in the proper attitude. But it can be a place, again, for the church to go and hide. We just have to do something. So Jonathan is about to show us what doing something looks like. Verse 6, let's go across to the outpost of those pagan uncircumcised fellows, he says. Now that's not a racist rant. That's not what Jonathan is saying. He knew that his circumcision was a sign of the covenant of God with them and him with God. That's what it meant to him. And that's what he was basing his courage on. That he had this, he knew God was with them. He said he would be with them. And I think sometimes that maybe we have lost as the church the empowering reality of exactly who we are. And I know you've heard this before. We've all heard this before. It's nothing new, right? I hear these great preachers standing up and saying these great messages. And I say, God, you're telling us, you're saying it, you're saying it. But God, help us to wake up. Help us to stop it from being just a sermon or just a talk or just something, right? Some religious thing we have to do on Sunday to sit and listen to this guy, right? But God, please let us 
have it become this instigator and this motivator and this thing that wakes us up out of this Western materialism and this crazy stuff that we're involved in in the West that we have called Christianity. Maybe we've forgotten who lives inside of us and, and what exactly it is we're here to do. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 3.10, his, meaning God's intent, was that now, through the church, the manifold, referring to the beauty of an embroidered pattern of the variety of colors and flowers. I love the way God sees us. Through the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Angels are waiting for us to move. They can't do anything until we do it. It's after we exercise faith that the signs and wonders come. You guys all know this. You all know it. You know it. I don't have to say it anymore. According to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul also says in 1 Timothy 3.15, This is the church of the living God, which is the pillar and the foundation of the truth. We are not the Shriners. We are not a rotary club just going out and doing good works. That is not what we are. We are the pillar and the foundation of truth in the earth. Maybe it's time to base our faith on what God can do instead of our personal and corporate resources. Maybe it's time to go back to that good old God can do anything. It doesn't matter if you have a lot of money. It doesn't matter if you have all the snazzy tools. It doesn't matter if you... I remember at New Life Center, we fed 300 people a week or a, a month. And we did the coffee house every week. We had a meal at each of them. And New Life Center had no money. None. Every month it was, are we going to be able to pay the bills this month? And every month for 14 years, we fed 300 people a month and never missed a meal. We never missed a bill. We never missed anything. It just came in. And we didn't feed them craft dinner. We fed them ham dinners, turkey dinners, roast beef dinners, we had someone who provided, gave free roast beef to us to have full, I mean, all, homemade potatoes, carrots, everything, the whole thing. And because God is about dignity, and I said, I will not put in front of somebody who every day is being told that they have no dignity and that they have no worth. I'm not going to slop spaghetti in front of them. If Jesus was upstairs, because the kitchen was downstairs, unfortunately, um, if Jesus was upstairs, I tell you, we would go out and get something better than spaghetti. And when we first started doing them, Jesus said, Keith, as you have done unto the least of these, you have done unto me. A woman came in, I'll never forget her, she was taller than I was, bigger than I was, and she was a wild woman. I don't know if you were there that day, Roseanne. And she come in and she, <laughs> she had um, the hair going, missing teeth, and whatever was on her for the last three days was all over the front of her. There was stuff all down here, don't even want to know. It was a mess. And she'd go to the guys, she'd go, Argh! and the guys would just <laughs> run back, and then, and the cast and them came downstairs, the servers, and said, Keith, there's somebody upstairs, you better go upstairs. So I go up and I look at her, and I said, okay. And uh, I said, how you doing? She didn't, wouldn't even really talk. I said, God, what do I do? He said, treat her with dignity. So I set her up her own table, and I put silverware down in front of her, and we didn't use paper plates. We used plates. If you're going home for Thanksgiving dinner, your mom is not going to put a paper plate in front of you. So put that down there. We serve her, we bring her the food because we serve to the table. Enough waiting in lines for food for people. They do it all week, right? So bring it to her, salt and pepper. And she sat there and she ate. And by the end of it, I'm talking to her. And a wonderful woman who's had a horrible life. She's dead now, but she had a horrible life. And walked out of that place smiling and laughing. 
and all it took was some cutlery and a little bit of dignity, you know? The love of God. God said the lo love will never fail. He didn't say the law would never fail. He said love would never fail. It'll never fail. So anyway, back to Jonathan. First uh, Samuel 14. What do, you, do what you think is best, the armor bearer replied. I am with you completely, whatever you decide. <laughs> the actual translation on that, the Hebrew in it, I am with you as your heart is with you. Man, oh man, we need that in the church now. We need people that are going to come alongside each other. And I am with you as my heart is with me. I am tied to you and I ain't going to give up. I don't care if what you're doing. And you can picture poor, this poor armor bearer, right? You can picture this guy. Jonathan says, all right then. We will cross over and let them see us. If they say to us, stay where you are or we'll kill you then we will stop and not go up to them. I'm thinking that's a pretty good idea right there. That's a good idea. But if they say, come on up and fight, then we will go up, and that will be the Lord's sign that he will help us defeat them. So the sign for Jonathan was an invitation to death. That was the sign for Jonathan that God was behind it. How many of us have an invitation to death that we say, oh yeah, that's the way God wants me to go. The road less traveled, the most difficult way. I always say you know how right something is to do by how hard it is to do. If you're ever trying to figure out what the right thing is to do, just do what the hardest thing is to do and you'll, you'll get on your way really well. And this poor, this poor armor bearer, right? When the Philistines saw them coming, they shouted, look, the Hebrews are crawling out of their holes. Then the men from the outpost shouted to Jonathan, come on up here and we will teach you a lesson. Come on, climb up right behind me, Jonathan said to his armor bearer, for the Lord will help us defeat them. Amazing stuff. And I just love, I want to meet that armor bearer. I want to meet him. <laughs> what were you thinking? Come on, tell me what were you thinking when Jonathan said, this is what we're going to do. God bless you because... He changed Israel's history. Two guys with no swords, nothing, changed Israel's, well, Jonathan had a sword, but changed Israel's history. Two guys who thought perhaps. So what is happening in your minds, what is happening in your spirits that you've said, perhaps if I did this, something might happen. Perhaps I should start this. Perhaps I should write this letter to the brother or sister I haven't talked to because there's, you know, families. We're always fighting in our families. So maybe I should try to get back in touch with family members and maybe forgive, you know. Do a little bit of that stuff. Throw a little bit of that stuff around. And uh, what is it that is the perhaps in your life? God did not put this in the Bible so we could glaze over it and go, oh, well, that was a pretty good story. I, I hope Mel Gibson makes a movie out of that. That would be really nice. When in actuality it was put so that you and I would sit in the year 2013 and we'd go, I wonder if God could do that. Because he's screaming from the hilltops of heaven, yes, I can. He's just waiting to do it again. He's just, I'm sick and tired of hearing about what's happening in the States. I'm sick and tired of hearing about the stories of the, over in Africa. I'm sick and tired of that. What is that all about? It's not because God doesn't want to do it here. The last I checked, the last I checked, God was still into saving people. People are still needing to be saved. So the only problem glitch in that, that little equation seems to be mm, us. That's the only difference. That is, seems to be the only thing that's... If you go down into the United States, I'll give the United States this. That they have this bizarre sense that they can do anything. If you've ever been down there, they have this entrepreneurial kind of, yeah, we can do that. Oh, yeah, we can do that. Oh, yeah, we'll take that. <laughs> and they took most of the world. But, the, I mean, it was still that they have this powerful sense of possibility. And it's, it's in the church. And they go, yeah, well, God can do that. Well, yeah, God can do that. And all of a sudden, you have these churches that are the size that they are. Now, they do have more population, and I give it that. And I don't think big churches mean that that's the only way you can prove there's a big God. 
That's not the only way. That's, the only, that's not the only way, right? But the fact of the matter is, it does represent something to us about the fact of what God might be willing to do and wanting to do. And I refuse to believe that he doesn't want to do it here. I refuse to believe that. I mean, if we, if we believe that, then what we'll do is, and it's a, it's a good little thing to note, that of all the Pentecostal churches in Nova Scotia in the Maritimes, they're all shrinking. And the only ones that aren't shrinking are the city churches, and they're just holding their own. Now, this is a reality. We can either sit around and say, the big bad wolf of the world has come and taken all our sheep, or we can stand up and say, wait a minute. This isn't the way this is supposed to be jigging down. This isn't the way this is supposed to be happening. What's that? We are the head, not the tail. What's, what, how does that work, God? How does this almighty, powerful God that was able to bring the Jews out of Egypt and, and do the incredible things that he's done all through history, uh, what, did you just decide to stop doing that? What, are we going to take on some kind of doctrine that says, you know, the miracle working power of God doesn't work anymore? No. No, it's just that we have lost faith in who we are and who God is. Really, the math is not much harder than that. It really isn't. That is the math, unfortunately. So, the key word here, it says the Lord will help us defeat them. Ah, we are expected to do something. We do the natural, God does the supernatural. Right? Easy math again. Really easy math. God did not make this complicated. That's why I'm able to do it. And all of us are able to do it. There is nothing complicated about the gospel. We do not need PhDs. Please, we do not need any more PhDs. We don't... I'm going to say this with reverence. We do not necessarily need anyone going through seminary anymore. I believe in seminary. I believe in that. And I know that's a controversial statement. And I believe in training and all that. But boy, oh boy, there's something about somebody who's just got touched by Jesus. Just got touched by Jesus, right? And all of a sudden, they're out doing what we know we should be doing, right? Why? Because they've been touched by Jesus. That's why. Not because they got knowledge. Not because they have some kind of... Uh, a piece of paper that makes them feel like they can now do something and they can now say something. But it's because they have been in touch with the power of God and they have to say something. They have to do something because the Spirit of God will not allow them to do otherwise. That is what will create powerful leaders. That's what will do it. Then you get training. Of course, absolutely. You either go to seminary or you go to life. One of the two. One of the two are going to train you. One's a little bit quicker. One's a little bit better, and it does help you to stop making some dumb mistakes. But the fact of the matter is, there is nothing that will duplicate interacting with the power and the, the power of Christ. That's what's going to do it. So, do something, and God will do the rest. When we look at uh, the raising of Lazarus from the dead, it first said, Jesus said, roll the stone away from the tomb. Jesus could have rolled that, tomb, that stone away. He was about to raise a guy from the dead. He could have rolled that stone away. But somebody had to go down and roll that stone away so the miracle could happen. And I believe that God is waiting for us to do something to roll our stones away so he can do a miraculous, powerful act. Whether it is phoning somebody who you haven't talked to or, or healing something or going and looking at that person that you go and get coffee to every, every morning. And instead of just going and getting coffee, before you go in, say, be intentional about it, say, God, do you have something to say to them? Do you have something to say to them? Right? Do you have something to say to them? I was on a, a flight coming back from Cuba, and I was looking, and, and I saw the, the stewardess go by, and, <laughs> and I got this thing to say to her. And uh, so I'm, I, I said, well, I'll say to her on the way out, because how are you going to, she's going, she's doing her job, so... I'm going outside, 
And she's up there saying goodbye to everybody. And I said, well, this, I'm going to hold up the line. I can't do this. I said, maybe it wasn't God. I, you know, I'm not going to say. So I'm out uh, at the airport, and I'm waiting. And like everyone's kind of gone, and I'm waiting for the drive. And who walks in front of me all by herself but this stewardess, right? I said, ma'am, could I, could I stop you for a minute? Can I just tell you something? Um, I said, God, and it's not because I'm some big crazy prophet guy. That's not it. It's because I look at those opportunities intentionally. You have to be ready. You have to be, say, God, okay, I'm ready for a download. Y'all got anything? You just send her along here and I'll, I'll do it. But if we're just bzzzing along looking at our phone doing this, uh, then no, you know, you'll miss the intentional opportunity to actually get something from God to speak into somebody's life. I guarantee you, every one of you here, there's somebody God wants you to speak to. I guarantee it. That's not, even, that's not even hard for me to say. But anyway, I said to her, I said, I don't know if this is going to make any sense to you, but I really believe that the next chapter of your life, God is saying, okay, go for it. And she looked at me and she said, uh, really? Really? And I went, oh, no. <laughs> you hate that. They just kind of look at you. And I said, uh, well, I said, I just really feel that there's the second chapter of your life. There's, it's, it's going to start. And that God is with you in it. And that it's time. And she stopped. And she said, you know what? I really don't know where she tells me. She said, I've just gone through a horrible divorce. And she said, I've got two kids. And she said, I've, I've, I've been thinking of getting out of this job. I've been doing it for 12 years. And she said, thank you. And I said, you just know that you're okay. It's time. Go do that. That woman will never forget that. She will never, ever forget that. I, I, you know how much of it was dead on? But that woman walked out of that airport with something that she'll never forget. And it, all it may take is you looking at somebody and just going, I just want to tell you that God loves you. I don't know why I'm saying it. Like, I just really feel to say it to you. And then be on your way. They'll never forget it. Never forget it. You'll leave it indelibly on their mind for the rest of their life. And they'll go home and say, you know what this person did? To them? And they're going to have a conversation, right? And on it goes. Do something, God will do the rest. So it says, Jonathan, so they climbed up using both hands and feet, and the Philistines fell before Jonathan, and his armor bearer killed those who came behind him. That good old armor bearer, right? They killed some 20 men in all, and their bodies were scattered over about a half an acre. That was the natural, right? Doing what they could do with the power they had. They did what they could do. Suddenly, panic broke out in the Philistine army, both in the camp and in the field, including even the outposts and raiding parties. And just then, what? I love it. An earthquake struck, and everyone was terrified. There's a supernatural. Dad just came on the scene, child. Dad just showed up. And I tell you, Jonathan was probably hoping Dad was going to show up because he just killed 20, and there's about 30,000 facing him right over that hill. And Dad showed up. But Jonathan had to go up that hill. He had to face that very terrifying situation, and he had to say, yes, my God is with me, and boy, oh boy, all of a sudden the earthquake struck, right? Saul's lookouts and Gibeah of Benjamin saw a strange sight. The vast army of Philistines began to melt away in every direction. Oh, how much do we long to look out and see Dad moving? Yes. Yes. To see Dad just kind of flexing that muscle. Let me see it, Dad. You know how kids, you know, they, you know, they look at their dad and they say, show me your muscles, Dad. Boy, oh boy, I'm hungry to see dad's muscles. I am hungry to see dad just kind of say, but, but I'm, he's saying to me, Keith, hey, I'm with you. Go, bro, go. But you got to do something. You got to do something that I can put my hand in. You got to do something that I can jump in behind you. And even if I have to fix it up, I'll fix it up. Oh, don't worry, I'll fix it up for you. But just go in there and do something. Oh, my heavens. So... Faith-filled human initiative. Think of that. Let that create a picture in your mind. Faith-filled human initiative can serve as an entrance point for the Lord's saving action. Faith-filled initiative, human initiative, actually what you have in your mind 
And you might be an armor bearer. You might be somebody who's an armor bearer called to come alongside. Or you might be Jonathan. And there's female Jonathans. And there's male Jonathans. There's children Jonathans. There's all kinds of Jonathans. But the fact of the matter is, if you have an initiative that you're thinking about, I'm telling you now's the time to do it. Now is the time to do it. God's favor is on the church of Halifax and not just the Pentecostal churches. <laughs> Those days are over, folks. I think you all know that. I guess we have, not, uh, we have not brought the great epoch of Christ upon the earth. We are a group. God chooses to work through Pentecostal, Baptist, Anglican, yes. Catholic, whatever churches. God's working through them all. I think we've all grown up to know that we do not have the kingdom and only us have the kingdom. When I first got into uh, church, of course I came from a Catholic background, I was 19 years old and for the first five years of my faith, I didn't even talk to other Pentecostals because I thought they were going to hell. And I thought if I went with them, I'd be going with them to hell. And so eventually I kind of bolted out of that, it took me about five to 10 years to come around and say, God is working through the whole church the whole church and we're just a little gem on the dress that's all we are and there's another gem over here that's catholic there's another one here that's anglican and brethren and baptist and whatever it is god's god's beautiful wedding dress is going to be adorned with wonderful precious things and it's the multicolored kind of way that the church is and the and the different things that we bring to it dare to step out and do the natural god will do the supernatural but don't wait for the supernatural before you do the natural. Make the phone call. Visit the neighbor. Talk to unchurched people. Dare to be the ones to step out from hiding in the church. And God will do something. God will do something. So, here we are. It's 5 to 12. And I know you guys usually get out at 12, right? So, um, what, what, I, what I'd like to do is... If anyone would like prayer, uh, y'all come up the front. And uh, for those that are here, because I'm going to be praying with, at this volume, um, if you do want to, you know, socialize, if you could just, you know, do it quietly and stuff, because there, there will be something going on here, I, unless nobody comes up. I mean, then, the, then nothing will be going on. But um, uh, that's what we'd like to do. I don't know if you have a particular closing, Jonathan, that you need to do. Is it okay to just go right into it? Okay. Uh, Father, I just thank you right now in Jesus' name. I thank you for your word, which is powerful and cuts deep into us, Father God. I pray for the comfortable and the uncomfortable aspects of it. And Lord, I pray for those that are unable to stay here today, that Lord, you'd be with them as they go, that you would speak to them as they put their head down at night and whisper your wonderful natural initiative that you have for them to do, Father God. And let them know that you are with them and that the armor bearer of their souls will be with them as they go into whatever it is that you feel to call them into, Father God. And Father, for those that come forward for prayer, I pray again, Holy Spirit, that as I know you love your children, Dad, I know how much you love your children, and I pray and ask that your spirit would be here again to speak and to guide and to encourage and to instruct us through prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. So come on up if you want prayer. And again, the reason I use the microphone is so that people will know whether or not it's crazy, it's nuts, or if, uh, if it's, it makes sense, you know. So many things have been said prophetically over people, and it's been so damaging. So if you want, just line up here. Hallelujah. Father God, I thank you for my sister, for your daughter. And I pray, Lord, that you would continue to work in her life that you would continue to give her instruction and the Lord will give you instruction. The Lord will guide you and you will see the signs that are needed. You will see them. The Lord will make sure that you, you get off in the right place and that 
you see what you need to see. And at times the at times the road does seem like it's long and it's just trees and trees and darkness and trees. But I want to encourage you today and let you know that there is an off ramp. There is an off ramp. And the Lord has not forgotten you and he has not left you without directions. And the Lord will give you this. So be encouraged today. Be strengthened in your determination. And the Lord would call you to continue going on strong. It's time to lift up your head. It's time to look to the horizon again. It's time to look up and out. And it's been a long time since you've done that. It's been a long time since you've lived with expectation, positive expectation. But the Lord will let you know and does want to let you know that there is an off-ramp. And that you will see the sign. So be at peace and be encouraged. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Father God, I thank you for my brother, your son. And I pray, Father God, that you would continue to give him your wisdom and continue to let him know that you are with him. Father, I thank you for him, for your spirit to fill him. And I pray for renewal over you, that deep hunger that's within you for renewal. Um, I just really have a sense of that. I have a feel for that deep hunger that's in you for renewal and an intimacy. And I release that upon you today by faith a deep renewal in your spirit, almost like an awakening, almost like a coming, a coming back to the beginning, a coming back to the beginning. This is what the Lord wants to do for you, to bring you back to the beginning. And the Lord is able to make new and able to make the path clear and easy. And there's been a lot of rough times. There's been a lot of rough going. But the Lord can bring you back to the beginning. Hallelujah. John, just bring the volume down. Hallelujah. Just take your hands. Father, I thank you for my sister. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in her life. And the Lord is working in your life. The Lord is working in your life. And I release you in the name of Jesus Christ from condemnation. I release you from dejection. I release you from the heavy burden of life. I release you in Jesus' name. I speak joy and gladness into your soul. And I speak like it's almost as if a, a dusting off has to happen. And the Lord is going into that room. He's going to go into that room. And he's going to dust all that stuff off. And he's going to bring light into that room. And there's a lot of clutter in it. These are metaphors, as you know, spiritual metaphors that the Lord is using. But he is going into that room. And he's going to bring light and clean up an area. This is not saying that there's sin and all that stuff. This is not what God is saying. He's going into that room in your life that has been cluttered and unattended to. And he's gonna bring light and he's gonna clean and he's going to rearrange it and he's going to put it in order. This is the word of the Lord for you today, that he is going to put some stuff in order that was not in order and some stuff that was really just hidden away, stogged away, and just really kind of just a jumble of confusion. The Lord's going to go in there and he's going to bring order and clarity. Father, I thank you for my sister and I pray you bless her this morning and that you continue speaking to her. Have your strength be renewed, I pray this morning. Your strength be renewed. And uh, I really feel the Lord just wants to encourage and strengthen you to continue on. I 
take authority over fear and being afraid. I take authority over that in the name of Jesus Christ. Perfect love will cast that out. As you know, your Father loves you and he will do only what is best for you. Only what is best for you. So you don't need to fear the future. You don't need to fear what the Lord may do in your life. Because the Lord does it with love. And he loves you. So you be encouraged to know that the Lord has not forgotten you and he has not given up on you and he has not seen that, una- he has not forgotten that unattended stuff. He knows and he is there with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Just going to take care of you. Father God, I thank you for my sister, your daughter. And I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in her life. Father, I pray the Holy Spirit is just kind of all over you and uh, the Holy Spirit wants to be your friend and I know you already have a relationship with the Holy Spirit, but there is a closeness, there is a completeness that the Holy Spirit wants to bring upon you and in your life to own you completely, to own you completely. It's as if he just wants to completely envelop you. Father, I pray for my sister, that Lord, however that manifests in her life and in whatever way, I pray you would give her understanding and discernment to see how that will work and what that would look like and how to allow you. I pray you give her the ability to allow you, Father God, The Lord, I just keep feeling the Lord wants to take full possession of you. It's not like you're not saved or anything like that. It's not that. It's just that the Lord wants to have a greater, a greater ownership of you. And an intimacy with you. And Father, I pray as she goes, that Father God, you would encourage her and give her wisdom about how to walk with this. The Lord's going to change the way you look at the world. There's going to be a new filter through which you look at the world. The Holy Spirit is going to give you this. And you will see the world in a different way. 